Good afternoon, everyone. This is Maria Blaise Costello, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. We'll give folks just a couple more seconds to join us. What I'd like to do uh, to start things off is welcome you to the webinar, which is being sponsored today by the Clean Energy States Alliance and its Sustainable Solar Education Project. So today we're going to discuss consumer protection for community solar. So as everyone is logging on, I'm quickly going to go over a, a housekeeping slide with you. Today's webinar is being broadcasted in an audience listen-only mode, so you'll be able to hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. You have two options of uh, listening to the audio portion of the webinar. You can either choose to use your desktop speakers or a headset with mic and speakers, or you can use the telephone. So either way will work. And again, you are all muted, so we will not be able to hear you. But we are interested in getting some questions from you, so you'll see here on the screen that there is a question box, which you should please submit questions as they occur to you throughout the webinar. Simply type in your question and hit send. All of your questions will be queued up, and they will be reviewed as time allows following today's presentations. So with that, what I'd like to do, and hopefully we have enough folks um, on is just to remind you that again this webinar is being recorded and we will archive the recording of this webinar along with all of our other webinars on CESA's website and you can access this webinar recording probably by tomorrow as well as all the ones we have archived at www.cesa.org slash webinars. So just again a reminder to please submit questions as they occur to you on the questions panel on your console. Hit send and we'll review your questions at the end of today's presentation. So I'd like to turn this over quickly to Warren Leon. Warren is the Executive Director of the Clean Energy States Alliance and he'll be the host of today's webinar. So Warren, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Maria. I first want to let you know a little bit about the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a national organization composed of um, state energy um, organizations and other public entities that are engaged in advancing clean energy. And you can see our members up there on your website, on your screen. And if we go to the next slide, you can see that this particular webinar is being produced out of our Sustainable Solar Education Project, which is a two-year effort to bring information to state and municipal officials and any other stakeholders on two topics, how to ensure that solar remains consumer friendly and how to ensure that solar benefits low and moderate income households. And this project is being funded by the U.S. Department of Energy's SunShot Initiative. And if we could go to the next slide, you can see on our website a large number of resources that have been produced for the Sustainable Solar Education Project. We've produced six guides, and the one you're going to hear about today is the last of the six. We've done a large number of webinars, and you could access the webinar recordings. Um, we're going to be doing an online course come the fall and winter, and we are doing some in-person training sessions. We also produce a free monthly e-newsletter that highlights what's going on around the country related to low-income solar and solar consumer protection. And if we could go to the next slide, you know, when we were putting together our agenda for the whole Sustainable Solar Education Project, we realized that community solar was really booming and there was increasing interest in it and that community solar posed some unique consumer protection challenges. And we thought it would be important to produce a guide focused on what states and municipalities could do to provide consumers with adequate information and protection if they were engaged in community solar. And we scoured the country for people to write this guide, and sure enough, the best people to produce it were right here at CESA, Diana Chase and Nate Hausman. Diana Chase is a program associate for CESA, um, and she focused primarily on solar. Um, she's a graduate of Vermont Law School's 
program in energy regulation and law, and she has worked as an advocate for the Conservation Law Foundation at the Vermont State House and has done a variety of other work related to clean energy issues. Nate Hausman is a project director for CESA and in particular is project director for the Sustainable Solar Education Project. He's an attorney licensed to practice law in both California and Vermont, and he's worked on, at CESA on solar issues for several years, um, and he has been a visiting attorney with places like the Environmental Law Institute. Well, they're going to give you an overview of what's in this new guide, and then we'll have time for questions. So um, let me turn it over to Diana and Nate. Thank you, Warren. Uh, as Warren said, we're going to talk about our new guide on community solar consumer protection. And let's see if I can just advance this slide here. There we go. Oops. Um, so as you can see uh, from the cover, this guide is intended primarily for state officials and state agencies and focuses on what states can do to ensure there are appropriate consumer protections for community solar. But certainly the guide could also be interesting and useful to other people who work in the field or are just interested in the issue. So why this guide? Um, community solar is, is growing rapidly in many parts of the country. Um, <clears throat> states have an opportunity to consider consumer protection issues that may arise with community solar and to decide whether any new or targeted consumer protections are appropriate. Um, community solar can enable broader participation in solar uh, by allowing renters as, as well as people who just don't have um, roofs that are good for solar to, to go solar. And the economies of scale and, and relative simplicity of construction of community solar projects um, can help to accelerate the adoption of solar and provide benefits um, to both to individuals and to their communities, uh, as well as the world as a whole. Um, but in order to maximize the benefits of community solar, it's a good idea to make sure there are appropriate uh, consumer protections. Um, <clears throat> you might think, well, we already have rooftop solar and that's working pretty well, so why do we need to do anything different in terms of consumer protections for community solar? Um, here are some of the important differences between rooftop and community solar that can affect the need for consumer protections. Uh, first of all, rooftop solar is more concrete and community solar is more abstract in terms of the customer relationship with the solar panels. Um, rooftop solar is more established and familiar and community solar is newer and less familiar. Rooftop solar involves long-term commitments Community solar uh, sometimes involves long-term commitments, but sometimes involves short-term commitments. And rooftop solar um, is, is only available uh, to homeowners who have suitable roofs, and community solar can be more broadly available um, in the sense that where programs exist and there is sufficient capacity, um, renters and anyone who doesn't have a suitable roof can sign up. So what is community solar? Um, there is no universally accepted definition of, of what community solar is. What we give here is, is the definition um, we use in our guide. And also the term, the term shared solar is sometimes used to mean the same thing. Um, we define community solar as a purchasing arrangement in which multiple customers share the electricity or the economic benefits of solar power from a single array. An array large enough to serve multiple customers is built in a single location and individual customers sign up to own or lease parts of the array or to purchase or be credited for some portion of the electricity generated by the array. And this is important. Community solar customers have voluntary contracts or subscriptions to participate in the project. Individuals or businesses can choose to participate and other customers of the same utility uh, can choose not to participate. So even if everyone agrees with the definition in the previous slide, um, community solar can take very different forms in different places. 
Um, in some places, community solar is understood to mean a utility program in which customers can choose to pay extra for green power, much like a, a green pricing program. And in other places, uh, community solar generally refers to a way for customers to pay less for electricity by leasing part of a privately owned array. Um, so some of the differences, some of the variations um, between models, who owns the array? Usually community solar arrays are owned either by a utility or by private developers, but in some cases they may be owned by nonprofits or by groups of consumers or by someone else. Who do customers interact with? Um, this means, first of all, who recruits the customers and manages the subscriptions. This could be, again, a utility or a private developer, but it could also be an organization that specializes in managing subscriptions. It could also be, again, a nonprofit or someone else. The other part of this question is, is who handles the billing? And again, usually this is either a utility or a private developer. How do consumers buy community solar? Generally, customers who buy community solar either pay for it all up front or else have a monthly payment for as long as their subscription lasts. Do customers benefit financially from community solar? Again, it varies. Um, there, in some cases uh, where customers pay for community solar with a monthly subscription, they may be saving money from day one. In cases where they pay up front, um, they may have enough savings uh, from the program that after a certain amount of time they've paid back their initial investment. There's also cases where customers expect to begin saving money eventually um, depending on increases in utility retail rates. And there may also be cases where customers have no expectation of ever saving money with community solar, but some people would say that doesn't count as community solar if the customers have no expectation of ever saving money. Um, that's not part of the definition that we're using. What is the rate of compensation? Again, it varies. Um, in some cases, community solar customers are compensated at the retail rate. In other cases, there may be a, a value of solar rate or some other rate. And in cases where the utility owns the array and handles all the billing, the question of rate of compensation might not really apply. The compensation and the subscription price are all folded together in the special rate. How easy is it to adjust the amount of the subscription or to cancel? <clears throat> Sometimes community solar programs allow customers to adjust the amount of the subscription or cancel without penalty. And how does it compare to rooftop solar? Um, as, I, as I think I said before, in some cases, in some states, community solar is really a variation on rooftop solar where the panels happen to be located somewhere else. And in other cases, community solar is really nothing like rooftop solar and is more like a utility um, green pricing program. So there are lots of different kinds of community solar consumer protection issues. And some of them are the same issues that apply to a lot of other consumer products. Um, and, I, and these are things that, that you know, might come up in, in a lot of different contexts, things like high pressure sales tactics. Um, and then there are other issues that apply both to rooftop solar and community solar, though maybe more to one than the other. And these are, quest these are issues like um, confusion about renewable energy certificates or understanding escalator clauses, things that are often part of solar contracts. And then there are a few issues that really are unique to community solar, um, like the one I mentioned earlier about whether customers are um, allowed to adjust the amount of their subscription during the course of the contract. And that's the kind of thing where states can decide if that's something they want to ensure that community solar customers have access to. So one of the possible consumer protection issues um, with community solar is, is simply um, product confusion, where the customer just isn't really clear on what they're buying. Um, compared to rooftop solar, community solar is an abstract product. You'll likely never see your panels, and signing up for community solar is, is essentially um, a matter of paperwork. Also, every community solar project can be different, and customers can be left to figure out for themselves what community solar means in each case. 
also, and, and this is similar to rooftop solar, um, in different cases, community solar customers are paying for different things. They may be paying for ownership of panels. They may be paying for uh, the lease of those panels. They may be paying for electricity generated by certain panels. They may be paying for a percentage of electricity from the entire array. Um, or there are other possibilities. Maybe they're paying for a pre-established number of kilowatt hours. And this can be confusing, not just because some community solar contracts are leases, uh, or some involve buying a percentage of output from the array or, or whatever, but also because these things can be inherently confusing. Just, just understanding what a solar lease is can be inherently confusing. Renewable energy certificates. It's another potential source of confusion is, is renewable energy certificates or RECs. I assume most of our audience is familiar with the concept of RECs. Um, RECs are a tradable commodity that represent the environmental value of renewable power. And they're generated whenever electricity is generated from solar panels or wind turbines or some other renewable source. A lot of the time, solar developers sell RECs in order to help finance projects so that the electricity they end up selling to customers isn't renewable electricity because the RECs have been sold to someone else. And in community solar in particular, there's, there's often a trade-off. In those models where customers are saving money with community solar, it's often because the RECs are sold to someone else. And in those models where customers get to keep their RECs, they often have to pay a premium to participate. The real consumer protection issue here is that customers should understand what RECs are and why they matter, and should also know if the, if the RECs have been sold to someone else. And there are you know, good resources out there for understanding and explaining RECs. Um, the Center for Resource Solutions has some particularly good resources on that subject. So contracts can be confusing. Um, here are some of the questions that, that customers should think about when they're reviewing a community solar contract. Um, Nate will talk a little later about the disclosure requirements that have been adopted in some states to make sure these kind of contract provisions are, are clearly spelled out for customers. Um, but keep in mind that you know, your contract may look different, um, and we're just highlighting some issues uh, to draw attention to them. So what is the duration or term of the contract? Community solar contracts can have terms up to 20 years or more. Um, many of them are much shorter. What happens to the contract if I move to a different house? Can the customer take the community solar subscription with them to a new home? Um, maybe in some cases that's possible only if they're within the same utility service territory. Do I have the right to terminate the contract without penalty, either within a certain time or at any time? Is a sign-up fee or deposit required? And if it is, is the sign-up fee additional to the upfront payment or the monthly payment? And will the sign-up fee be refunded if the project is never built? Developers often need a deposit um, before they construct the project. So if the project, for whatever reason, never gets built, does the customer get that money back? What happens if the community solar array goes down or is taken offline? Will the customer be notified if the array is offline? Does the contract include a production guarantee? So if there's a particularly cloudy summer and there isn't a lot of uh, electricity generated, will the customer be uh, made, uh, made whole for that in some way? Does the customer own part of the array? Um, most of the time with community solar, customers do not actually own the panels. In some cases, they do. Um, it's a good thing for the customer to know. And will they be able to take advantage of state and federal solar incentives, or will those go to the project owner or developer? And this refers to things like the federal um, investment tax credit, which is such an important part of financing many solar projects. Um, it, it often depends on, on, at least in part, in whether the customer actually owns part of the array. If you don't own the array, your chances of being able to take advantage of these kind of incentives are very low. If you do own part of the array, you may be able to take advantage, but um, it's a very complicated issue and people should certainly be consulting their, their tax advisors about this kind of thing. Um, 
what is the compensation rate for electricity generated from the project? Is that fixed or, or could it change perhaps based on regulatory actions? So if you start off um, in a program where you're receiving a net meter compensation at full retail rate for the electricity generated, what happens if three years down the road the Public Utility Commission uh, changes the rules and abolishes net metering? Is that a regulatory risk that you're taking when you sign up for community solar? If you're uh, paying upfront, how much is the upfront payment? Does that include all fees and other costs? And how long will it take for savings to cover costs, also known as the payback period? And if you're paying monthly, is there an escalator clause that will make payments increase over time? Escalator clause is a, is a thing that uh, customers are, are often um, confused about and it can certainly uh, make a big difference in, in their financial uh, return on the project. What is the rate of increase and, and how much will the customer be paying each month by the end of the contract? Are there late payment penalties and, and is it possible to downsize or upsize the uh, subscription after signing up? And I will turn this over to Nate now. Great, thanks Diana. Um, uh, I think that was a good good overview of some of the, the background on community solar and some, some of the contract provisions. Um, I'm gonna provide a little bit more on some of the existing consumer protections, background consumer protections that may exist out there, um, as, as well as talk a little bit about what states can do. So uh, first I just want to note that uh, community solar consumer protection, the space isn't a vacuum. There are already some consumer protections that exist on the state and federal level that could apply to community solar. So some states have implemented specific rooftop solar um, protections or and some states have also um, implemented community solar uh, specific protections. On the federal level, the Federal Trade Commission or FTC uh, has broad authority to regulate unfair and deceptive trade practices. So the FTC has jurisdiction over things like solar marketing and, and obviously that, that might include community solar um, subscription marketing and the like. And it's important to note that the FTC has given some attention to, to uh, the solar industry. Last year, the FTC conducted a full day workshop on competition and community, uh, excuse me, consumer protection um, issues as they relate to solar energy. As part of that workshop, the FTC actually opened a public comment uh, period um, and, and comments are available, you can see the comments that were submitted, um, they're available to the public on the Federal Trade Commission's website. You can also see uh, video recordings of that, of that workshop uh, on the agency's website as well. So existing, you know, I, I, I mentioned that there are some federal consumer protection laws that, that may apply. I'll let you read through this list of, of statutes on this slide, but I do want to say that uh, collectively, these laws regulate areas that may apply to certain aspects of community solar sales and marketing. Um, the regulated areas include electronic marketing, leasing disclosures, electronic fund transfers, discrimination in credit transactions, collection and use of consumer information, unfair and deceptive trade practices, consumer product warranties, financial privacy from government intrusion, lending disclosures, telemarketing and, and automated uh, telephone equipment, misleading financial products and services. And uh, the Uniform Commercial Code is also listed on here, which regulates sales and commercial transactions. Um, actually, the, the Uniform Commercial Code is a model code that's adopted by states, uh, but it has been adopted by, by all states in, in part or in whole. So. I put it on this slide as well. Great, so, um, so in addition to those uh, federal consumer protections, there's also um, state consumer protections. Um, every state has its own consumer protection laws prohibiting deceptive trade practices and sometimes these mirror um, uh, the authorizing statute for the FTC. Um, these statutes are, are sometimes referred to as unfair and deceptive acts and practices or UDAP statutes. Um, and some states have 
have implemented specific uh, consumer protection measures as well. These come in, in a few different fla flavors. Um, states like Arizona and New Mexico have en enacted disclosure laws that govern rooftop solar contracts. Um, they require companies to disclose uh, to consumers things like the number and amount of payments uh, to be made over the life of a, of a solar lease or PPA. Um, another flavor is um, disclosures for specifically for community solar um, and in the course of developing rules implementing community solar some states have included these mandatory community solar contract disclosures as part of their program regulations. I'll discuss some of the states that have taken this approach in a moment but it's worth noting that because states may legislatively enable community solar programs, community solar is sometimes treated differently from rooftop solar and community solar programs may come with their own set of rules as a result. And then the third thing um, uh, states have done is, uh, you know, another way states can provide uh, consumer protection is, is through uh, consumer education. So an example of this is that the Minnesota Department of Commerce has a website dedicated to community solar. It contains uh, an FAQ, a frequently asked consumer questions um, page for those thinking about subscribing to a community solar array. And, and then in addition, sort of in Minnesota, there's other groups um, like a partnership of the clean energy resource teams or certs that provide some unbiased information about community solar to a perspective uh, customers as well. Great, so I mentioned I was going to uh, talk about some states that have mandatory disclosures for community solar. Examples of this are Maryland and Minnesota. Uh, Hawaii also has a proposed framework um, too and I'll, I'll touch on that. So Minnesota's um, program requires community solar subscription to disclosures. I mentioned uh, Minnesota's clean energy resource teams already or certs developed. Uh, they developed a, a checklist, a, a solar garden subscriber disclosure checklist which includes a list of requirements that Minnesota community solar providers have to comply with. The disclosures, we have uh, the full disclosures in our guide but uh, uh, the, I'll just say that the, the disclosures include a description of all recurring and one-time charges and whether the charges may increase over the course of the service. They also uh, require a description of the conditions of service. Uh, Maryland, uh, the Maryland Public Service Commission has adopted regulations for a community solar uh, pilot program that happened last year. This the spring it began accepting applications from developers uh, and consumer contracts in Maryland's programs must contain uh, all material terms and conditions among other things that includes uh, the terms under which the pricing will be calculated over the life of a community solar contract and a good faith es estimate of the subscription price expressed as a flat monthly rate or on a per kilowatt basis. And then also, I noted, um, I'll note that the, the Hawaii uh, PUC Public Utilities Commission has, has a proposed framework for the state's community solar program there. That's called the Community-Based Renewable Energy Program. Uh, it's, it hasn't been finalized, but uh, the framework includes a program disclosure checklist and subscriber agreement uh, for each subscriber, quote, to ensure appropriate consumer protection and that the subscriber organizations have adequately informed prospective subscribers on important programmatic considerations. So again, a full list of those of those disclosure requirements uh, are included in, in the guide, but a lot of them include some of the contract provisions that Diana mentioned earlier in the webinar. So if you're a state um, uh, thinking about consumer protection for community solar, what are some things you might think about? Well, so a few questions that you might uh, think about sort of as, as a background to, to the kinds of, uh, in thinking about the kinds of consumer protections you might want to implement. So, you know, one question is how big is the community solar market and how quickly is it growing in your state? Consumer protection may be most pressing in areas that are experiencing the greatest, the greatest community solar development. Another question you might ask is what consumer protections already exist? This is sort of self-explanatory. Um, you know, what, what protections has the state already, does the state already have in place? 
How do consumers benefit from community solar? So the more, you know, this has to do with the rates of compensation, the, the more customers benefit from a community solar subscription, the less need there may be to, to, for consumer protections, you know, along the lines of whether or not, uh, you know, one question is whether or not uh, you'd be paying a premium to participate in community solar, and that may impact the kind of um, protections you implement. How easy it is for customers to withdraw from a community solar subscription. In places where customers make long-term commitments, states may want to may want to think um, a little harder to to ensure that customers are well informed before they sign up. Another question um, are what. What are the state's goals for 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 community solar? Um, some states have aggressive renewable portfolio standards or 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 goals for for solar more broadly. If those, uh, you know, if that's in place, you you, you know, the state may want to consider um, more con consumer protections. Or if a state has a particular goal for increasing solar access, for instance, for lower and moderate income individuals, um, that may require different kinds of consumer protections. And then another question um, uh, officials may want to ask are, are is, is a state agency uh, already getting a lot of questions or complaints? States may want to check with uh, the, eternal, the Attorney General's office in their state to learn whether the AG's office has already taken solar related enforcement actions or to evaluate how actively the office is, is asserting itself in, in, regulation, in regulating solar. All right, so um, you know I've already I've already touched on some of these, but there are different ways states can take action. There are different tools that states have in in, in their arsenal that they can use. Um, some of them include uh, consumer education. Obviously, that involves making information available to to potential community solar customers, um, so they can understand what they're being offered and evaluate options. Um, you know. Uh, Warren will, I think, cover this at the end of the webinar, but the Clean Energy States Alliance has a guide uh, that's really focused on solar information for consumers and what states can provide along these lines. Some information in there may be helpful. I already mentioned Minnesota provides some information on its website about community solar. That's an approach um, certainly states can take. For you know, uh, it may be helpful to provide a, a kind of comparison for customers between rooftop solar and community solar, or a kind of comparison about how comp ra compensation rates are offered. Those are the kinds of uh, education tools that states can provide. Um, guidelines and, and regulations. Guidelines are generally voluntary. Um, uh, regulations uh, binding. If a solar program uh, has a part of it is an essential part of a solar um, guidelines for guidelines can effectively become mandatory um, and then in addition it's it, there's certain grievance procedures and enforcement um, you know the effectiveness of any sort of rule depends on how whether or not it's it's enforced and uh, and one state one mechanism states can use to enforce laws on businesses is licensing. In states where a business such as a solar in installation requires certain licensing, violation of rules can be grounds for revoking a license. This, this effectively gives states some enforcement leverage. Um, and then, you know, Maryland's community solar program, for instance, has an embedded path of, of recourse for, for customers that have had issues when a violation of the state's community solar regulations, uh, when a customer alleges a violation, um, there's a particular uh, commission, the Office of external uh, relations that can provide a, a refund for any unwarranted fees or overcharges and then I'll also just note that you know in all states there's judicial recourse um, if there's uh, contract issues under some of the statutes that I already reviewed and then I want to review some existing solar consumer protection resources. So there are some resources that are specific to community solar. There are also some resources that are widely applicable to, to rooftop solar that may have some relevance in the community solar um, arena as well. 
Um, CISA has a variety of resources in addition to the guide we're talking about today, um, and, and I think Warren will review some of those at the end of the webinar, but one that bears mentioning now is, is we have a guide titled, A Homeowner's Guide to Solar Financing, that covers leases, loans, and power purchase agreements. We've got a, a Spanish language version of that, and we've also helped a few states produce state-specific uh, versions of that. It's a guide that covers um, rooftop systems, but some of the same contract elements and financing terms that are mentioned in that guide are also relevant in the community solar context. In addition, well, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, or IREC, has, ha, that's a nonprofit focused on supporting the development of sustainable energy. Um, they've developed uh, several resources. Two, one that relates to uh, shared solar is some guiding principles for the development of shared renewable energy programs. IREX outlines five principles for, for shared renewable energy programs. Those are expanding consumer access, offering tangible economic benefits, uh, putting consumers first, promoting fair competition, and complementing existing programs. Obviously, those those um, have you know considerable consumer protection uh, implications. And then I also just should mention too that in addition to, to that guide, which is focused on community or shared solar, there's all IREC has also developed uh, a B smart. Uh, a B Solar Smart Checklist, um, as well as a Clean Energy Consumer Bill of Rights. Industry has also taken an active role. Um, the Solar Energy Industries Association, or SIA, in partnership for the Coalition for Community Solar Access. That's the Community Solar Industry Trade Organization. They've produced a guide specifically for community solar uh, consumers, it, it explain it offers some advice for how to be an informed consumer and explains what to do if uh, community solar contract issues arise. And then, in addition to those, SIA also has a, a solar com uh, consumer protection resource webpage that has a lot of links to, to various resources, including some of the ones I've already mentioned. Um, and then Diana already mentioned the Center for Resource Solutions. Uh, they have a, a lot of resources on RECs and renewable energy marketing claims including guidelines for, 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 for RECs, as well as best practices uh, in public claims for solar PV systems. And then just sort of a final afterthought before we, we turn it over and take some questions, I want to mention that, um, there it is, I want to mention that community solar projects may be subject to financial securities laws. In most cases, security compliance is less of a direct concern for the community solar customers than it is for project developers. But the key issue is often whether shares in community solar projects constitute securities. If the Security and Exchange Commission, or SEC, were to find a federal securities violation related to the transfer of a community solar share, the project developer or promote, promoter would likely bear the responsibility for the marketing of that. Um, the issue, it's an, you know, as I noted, it's an important issue for community solar developers to consider, but it could become a, com a consumer protection issue if an if an enforcement action would result in the halting of uh, project development project development after a customer has already signed up for a contract. So it's sort of more um, an issue on the community solar developer side, but I, but I mention it here and it's also mentioned and discussed in, in much more detail in an appendix to, to the uh, community solar guide we've produced. So with that, I think we'll turn it over, I'll turn it back over to Warren and we'll, um, we'll take some questions. Hey, thanks very much, Nate and Diana. Uh, that gave a good overview of the guide and not surprisingly, it led to a bunch of questions which I will ask. Uh, one person wanted to know, this was back on the definition of community solar, want to know about a rooftop array on an apartment building where the rooftop array is serving multiple customers in that building. Is that community solar? Yeah, I would consider that community solar, but I also think at some point um, the precise definitions and, and figuring out what fits in the category and, and, and what doesn't um, don't matter so much and that, you know, a lot of these issues apply um, to some 
in addition to the things that are most clearly community solar, they also apply to the slightly grayer areas like, like that question describes. And what happens to the community solar subscriber if the owner of a solar array that's used for a community solar project, if that company, whether it be a for-profit company or a nonprofit, if they go bankrupt? That is a very good question, and, um, some, and one more thing that it would probably be good to keep in mind um, when reviewing your contract, and, and um, if, if the answers aren't in the contract, to ask questions um, before the contract is signed, and from the point of view of state regulators, it, it may be the kind of thing that the state wants to create rules about. Uh, Nate, did you have anything more to add on that question? No, I'll just add that I think it's it's a it's an issue. You know, what happens if if a contractor goes out of business is an issue that comes up in the rooftop context as well, and that there are some resources, uh, you know, available to to answer that question. But it but it can be you know uh, it it can be a thorny issue. Okay, this is going back to the issue of racks and confusion over racks and. Somebody wanted to have a more complete explanation. If the re recs are sold to someone other than the community solar subscriber, why isn't that subscriber getting the renewable energy that they thought they were buying? I would, um, I, I will try to answer that question, but let me say that nobody answers that question better than the Center for Resource Solutions. And if, if people um, want, a, want to see what they have to say, they have a, a video on their, uh, which I believe is on their, their home page, which, which addresses this question very well. Um, the, the purpose of RECs is to track renewable energy. And whenever any energy, any electricity, I should say, is generated anywhere on the grid, it all goes into a big pool where all those charged electrons floating around are actually indistinguishable from each other. So when somebody flips on a light switch or, or in any other way draws on the electricity, there's no way of knowing where those electrons actually came from whether they came from a community solar array or a nuclear power plant or a coal burning plant or somewhere else because once they get into the grid all those electrons are exactly the same. And what the RECs do is enable the person who's generating the renewable energy to sell the renewableness to someone who wants renewable energy. It's, it's the only way you can really track where the renewableness is going because the electrons themselves can't be tracked, and I, I hope that I hope that made sense. Good, no, that was good explanation. And how about escalation clauses? Is there a typical percent used, and is the escalation rate normally figured on a yearly basis, or every few years, or something else? This, there can be enormous variation in this, so I can talk about what's typical, but um, every contract will be different, and some of them, some of them will be very different. Um, a typical escalator rate might be two to three percent, and in theory, um, that is compensating for um, future inflation rates and future increases in the retail rate of electricity. Um, but in fact, of course, nobody knows what future inflation rates will be or, or whether electricity rates will go up in the future, and if so, by how much. So um, there is inevitably a certain amount of, of risk involved um, and a little bit of uncertainty when, when dealing with escalator clauses. And this is Nate, and I'll just add that escalator clauses are compounding rates, so they compound on an annual basis. So usually, you sign up uh, for at an you know there's an escalation clause included in the contract initially, and then that that es es escalation um, compounds uh, on an annual basis over time. One person writes in saying that. Many community solar contracts are very lengthy documents with a lot of fine print. Uh, 
Have you seen any examples of streamlined, easy-to-follow contracts that still offer good consumer protection? Nate, do you want to address that? Yeah, I, I, I'll i try. Um, the, the short answer is, you know, I don't know. Um, the short answer is, is that, that I, I don't know. Uh, I know there are some, some sort of contract templates out there that exist. Um, in terms of ones that, that provide information up front, you know, I would look to, to some of the states that have required uh, community solar consumer protection disclosures um, because I think some of the companies operating in those states are very familiar with providing some of those upfront, um, you know, contract language. So again, I, you know, I mentioned uh, uh, Maryland is an example, Minnesota as well. Minnesota's program is pretty unique, but um, but those are states where where you might find um, a, a particularly robust uh, contracts because there's some uh, regular, you know, regulatory uh, uh, might behind them. Can you explain in more detail how the um, SEC would get involved, the Securities Exchange Commission would get involved? What would trigger an investment issue for them? Yeah, this is a very uh, complicated area. Essentially, there's a, a, a court case, the Howie court case, that governs whether or not an interest uh, in any kind of financial arrangement uh, constitutes a security. Um, and, and there's uh, certain factors, but essentially if, if the SEC were to deem that, uh, that you know, uh, an interest in a community solar array can look a lot like a security, much like, um, a, you know, a, a stock uh, by which you invest and get returns on that investment. And so the issue would be if the SEC, you know, if a, a particular community solar contract looked like that kind of financial arrangement, then it might be regulated as a security and that would trigger certain requirements. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, th that th it, you know, just by Triggering those requirements doesn't mean necessarily a community solar uh, developer couldn't couldn't operate that array, but those requirements are uh, incredibly onerous. So I think the the easiest thing to say would just be to to refer. Uh, this isn't a cop out, but I think the easiest thing would be to look at the appendix that that looks out looks at um, SEC regulation and securities regulation in the guidebook itself. So that's a short answer, and and you know uh, I can provide more if there's specific questions. No, I think that's a good point, and I, I would refer people as well to the appendix in the guide. It's very um, complete and very clear. Do you have examples of actual deceptive practices in marketing of community solar and how the applicable state's consumer protections addressed or failed to address the issue? I'll weigh in here um, and say that you know it's a relatively new sp new space, and there's many you know as as Diana mentioned, there's many different arrangements. So you know I have heard anecdotally of issues um, uh, coming up, but it's not uh, but there's not a lot of a huge body of of uh, research out there because it's a relatively new field. So I know that there are there has been consumer issues that have arisen um, you know related to some of the contract provisions mentioned, um, but uh, in terms of, you know, it's a, it's a little hard to say whether or not the consumer protections, because we don't have a long history, this, the consumer protections that exist in, in states that have them, you know, uh, again, uh, examples, uh, Maryland, that program has just just started uh, taking applications um, from developers, and, uh, and Minnesota, whether those have been effective in, in curtailing some of those issues that, that have arisen. I don't know if, Diana, do you have anything else to add on that? No, I'll just say that, um, you, you know, the rooftop solar industry is far bigger and, and better established than the um, community solar industry. And certainly in, in the world of rooftop solar, there have been um, a few cases of, of bad actors taking advantage of, of the um, booming industry and, and trying to take advantage of consumers with some deceptive practices. So. I, I do not have specific examples of that happening in community solar. I think um, states might want to think that if the community solar 
industry um, booms the way it looks like it might, it's, it may be a good idea to, to get ahead of the game and, and make sure the uh, consumer protections are in place even before um, problems appear. Yeah, and, and actually just one more um, afterthought on that on that point as well. I mentioned that the FTC has been active in the solar space um, with respect to, you know, regulating um, unfair trade practices and, and deceptive trade practices. Well, uh, you know, they have taken enforcement action in particular. It wasn't specifically in the on, uh, related to community solar, but it did involve generating um, if telephone calls, generating solar leads um, uh, for for people, and certainly that's the kind of issue um, that could come up. You know, those those kinds of issues could come up both in the community solar space as well as the rooftop solar space. So, um, so there have been there certainly have been issues uh, on on the rooftop side um, that 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 could could come up also in on in the uh, community solar context. Somebody writes in about low-income solar and wants to know, are there special protections that should be considered for low-income community solar subscribers? Are there examples of well-designed programs for that market segment? And who would a low-income customer turn to if there were concerns about a community solar subscription? Low-income community solar is something that is getting attention in a lot of states right now, but but mostly in a very um, early way. They're very early in the process, so there's not much of a of a track record of this. There are a few states that have begun trying to uh, implement low-income carve-outs in their community solar programs. Colorado is probably the first, but overall, it's 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 a new field. As far as special consumer protection issues, um, one issue is that most of the time when a person uh, decides to go solar, and this would apply both to rooftop solar and community solar, there's a certain amount of financial risk involved um, that they may expect to save money. It may be a situation where they probably will save money, but it's not guaranteed that it's going to turn out that way. Uh, maybe because of some regulatory action um, down the road where the Public Utility Commission alters the compensation rate, or maybe because retail electric rates don't go up the way they were expected to so that solar doesn't turn out to be so, such a good deal comparatively as they expected. Uh, but the point is that for a low-income person who has um, less of a financial cushion, those risks can be more important. Um, and since community solar um, is often thought of as something that can make solar more available to low-income people, for instance, because they're renters, uh, those issues of financial risk may need some, some special attention um, in community solar. Well, I'm going to ask one more question, and I'll say to some of the folks who wrote in questions that I didn't get to. Some of the questions were very specific to a specific, specific location and would not be applicable to everybody on the call, but if you want to um, ask those questions of Diana or Nate, um, please feel free to send them an email and they would try to follow up with you. But in terms of the last question I'll ask and then after that, mention a few other resources for people. Um, are there any state or federal rules that would require a developer to refund a consumer who paid a sign-up fee uh, in the event that the project is never built? Ooh, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, you know, again, the, the, the short answer is, is that um, it's, it's, I don't think that's there's a, there's a there is a clear answer to to that question. There are certainly uh, you know depending on the circumstances um, some laws that 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 could apply in certain contexts, um, but I'm not aware that there's sort of any blanket law that would cover all contexts. You know, it would depend on you know it could depend on contract law and the specific uh, contract that was that was signed and 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 what those contracts said, which is again why it's so important to to for 
consumers to read through those those contracts and that's why it's it's sort of I, I think states may want to consider providing information about some of the the, the issues uh, that, that can can arise with with contracts like that so there may be some uh, uh, statutes uh, that exist but it also may be a function of contract law and and be specific to the specific contracts that that were signed so um, so the recourse may be available of, of, available there great well, you folks can see on their screen places where you can go to find out more information about the Sustainable Solar Education Project and to sign up for our newsletter. And if you go to the website www.cesa.org and look under staff, you'll see a staff listing and you could find Nate and Diana's emails there if you want to write to them. If we could see the next slide. Here's the other guides we've produced for the Sustainable Solar Education Project, and they cover a range of topics, some of them like solar information cons for consumers and publicly supported solar loan programs have to do in great part with consumer protection issues and ways to uh, ensure that consumers are well treated in the solar marketplace. Uh, another one on standards and regulations for solar equipment installation, licensing and certification. That also is a way in which states can ensure high standards for solar installations, high standards for the people who install solar, and high standards for the equipment that's used. We also have guides on solar plus storage for low and moderate income communities and a general guide on solar for low income consumers which is called bringing the benefits of solar energy to low income consumers. I'd encourage you to look up all of those. We're going to be having other webinars in this series related to the Sustainable Solar Education Project and um, We'll let you know about them in the future. You can see Nate's email address here. I will mention to you finally a different webinar that's coming up next week, which CISA is doing. It's not on solar uh, directly, but it will be relevant to many of you, I suppose. And this is a webinar on the topic of what happens when renewable portfolio standards max out. Many renewable portfolio standards are reaching their or will reach their highest target in the next few years. What does that mean for the future of the renewable energy market in those locations? What can states do to ensure that there continues to be a vibrant market in those states for renewable energy? Well, I would like to thank all of you to for listening to the webinar today, and I'd especially like to thank Diana and Nate for their good presentations, and we look forward to hosting you on future webinars. Thank you.